Hello everyone and welcome back. We are going to restore a tube radio again. Um, it's been a while, I think it's about a year ago since I re last restored the tube radio. Um, because last summer um, I did the Telefunken operette. Um, since then I've also restored beginning of this year the, the Philips tuner, uh, which was also um, yeah tube based. Um, but Strictly speaking, that wasn't the radio. So it's been more or less a year since I've actually done a tube radio. And we have one here. Um, and it's a bit of a special one this time. Um, because this will be uh, the oldest radio I've ever worked on. Um, I don't know the exact um, timing or the exact production date. But I guess it's uh, about 1935 to 1937. Um, and it's a big one. See, I had to move back <laughs> to get it in shot because normally I, I film here using this small tripod on my desk, but I couldn't get it backwards uh, far enough to get it all in shot. It's also too high to fit on the bench here. Um, so it's a big one and it's also very deep and very heavy. Now this is an RR Radio. It's probably a manufacturer that you've never heard of. Honestly, I had also never heard of this brand before I picked up this radio. Um, and it, I searched a bit or I did a bit of research online and apparently it was a small manufacturer here in Belgium. Um, they were located in Anderlecht, which is one of the municipalities of Brussels. Um, and they produced radios from the beginning of the 30s until the end of the 50s. Um, so in the past there were a lot of small uh, radio manufacturers and uh, after the Second World War they either stopped to exist, they ceased to exist or they were bought up by larger companies. And then in the, yeah, in the second half of the uh, 20th century, then everything shifted to big brands and big manufacturers and these small manufacturers basically didn't survive. So RR uh, stands for the name of both um, founders of the company. I think they were called, let me see here, uh, Roy and Revol. So it's the, the first two initials of the two uh, founders of the company. And they produced radios mainly. Um, and there is not a lot of documentation to be found online on these models. Um, so I also don't know exactly which model this is. It's nowhere labeled. Um, so I don't know the exact date. I don't have any documentation on this particular model whatsoever. Um, I mean, I d haven't even found a picture online of this particular model. I haven't, I, I've searched a lot and I don't find anything on this design this radio um, so i think it is quite rare in the sense that they probably wouldn't have sold a lot and uh, lots of them didn't survive so we are looking here at a quite a unique piece um, and a quite an interesting piece in belgian history now there are quite a bit of models li listed still on radio museum um, i don't know exactly let me check quickly so they have uh, 111 models listed on um, Radio Museum, but lots of them don't even have pictures um, and not a single one has a schematic. So yeah, that's going to be a challenge. Um, I mean, so I don't know exactly which model it is, but I did find a couple of clues. Uh, let me show you. So I found this ad from the 1930s. I think it should be from 1936, which lists a couple of types of radios, um, including their prices. So you have the 640, the 650, and the 650L listed there. Um, now, you, as you see, they are clearly not this uh, radio. But if you look closer at the 650L, then you see that um, the dial and the position of the knobs is identical. Um, see, so the difference between the uh, 650 and the 650L is that in the 650 you have the speaker on the bottom and the dial on top. And then the 650L it's switched around and also the shape of the dial glass 
is also different between the 650 and the 650L. And the positioning here, positioning of these four knobs, and it also has four knobs, the 650 has three knobs. Um, so the position of these four knobs, the position of the dial glass, and also the indications on the dial here, they seem to be really, really, really similar. So I think that this is the chassis, the same chassis. So it's the same chassis, that's my theory at least, as this 650L. Um, and um, so there we already have a clue, because we know that the 650 is a model from 1936, because RR Radio um, labeled their model numbers, the first digit was the, the, the year of production. So 650 means uh, 1936. Um, so as you'll see, I think it'll be the same radio. Now, I don't know, obviously, if this one is also from 1936, if it was also designated as a 650L, if it was just available in different case or cabinet designs, or if it was maybe a model from a year earlier or a year later, when they simply changed the cabinet design, but they kept the chassis the same. I have no clue. If somebody has more information on RR radio than what is available online, especially if you have documentation or schematics, please share it. Um, you can always send it to me or even better, you can upload it somewhere to archive.org or uh, something like that or Electrotania um, because it will be, would be very interesting to know more about um, these type of radios. It's a piece of Belgian radio history that is um, yeah, a bit difficult to to track down actually. And now these three model ranges here, yeah, the 640 is um, clearly a cheaper model or a more basic model. And then the difference between the 650 and the 650L, I think the L might stand for something like large or luxurious or luxe, I don't know. Um, but the difference is this one knob here, see there is an extra knob and it has a band um, indicator. So see this dial over here, this is the indication if you are on like on which band. So now it's set to long wave. See, you can switch it. Um, that was also not available on the cheaper model. And it has a tone control. Um, I think the previous one didn't have a tone control. Now, that being said, uh, this still, I, even though it's the most luxurious uh, model that they had at that point, it's um, it was still not really a luxurious company they really um they really try to compete compete on price so as you see it also on the flyer uh, it's uh, listed de super à très bon marché uh, which basically means um two super heterodyne radios at a very good price and if you compare their prices to prices from other manufacturers then you see they are indeed cheaper i mean the um, 1550 francs that is listed here um, in other brands, you had an entry-level model um, for this price. So they did compete on price at that point, and maybe that's the reason why they never got really, really big. Um, I don't know, um, but it it's not a super luxurious model, and I've also read online that the schematic or that the circuit inside is also not extremely advanced, but we'll get into that later when we talk a bit about the interior. But now maybe it's time to get a closer look uh, to the radio itself and I will stop waffling about the history even though I, I really like the, to also give a bit of a context on the history. Um, but let's have a closer look to the radio itself. Well, as you'll see, it's not in great condition. Uh, <laughs> Um, understatement, but I think for a radio which is like 90 years old almost, um, it's not too bad. Um, the dial cloth obviously needs to be replaced. Um, we have here on the dial, there is a, the glass missing. So um, normally there should have been a glass um, here uh, in front that's missing, which also would have covered up the dial bulb um, and the dial plate here it's a piece of cardboard i think it's completely yellowed so that's also not in great condition um, 
then we have here the buttons. One button is not original. I guess this one is not original because this one is Bakelite and these are grass and this is also brass. So I think these three are original. That one is obviously not. This is the bandwidth switch. You can switch between Grand Onde, which is long wave, and Petite Onde, which is short wave. But I'm not convinced that it's actually short wave. I don't know exactly what the bands are for this radio. We'll have to check that later. Um, this is the tuning, but it's totally stuck. You can see here that you have like a wavelength indicator. But I think, at least that's what I see on the flyer that I showed you earlier, there should also be a dial pointer here somehow. And that one is missing. I also don't see that turning, so we'll have to check. And at least this, this complete mechanism is totally stuck. And then this one, one of the, those is the volume and one is the tone control. I think this is the volume and this might be the tone control. I have no idea. But um, yeah, that's the controls. Very basic, obviously. It's a radio from the 1930s. Um, then here, the varnish is not in great condition. Well, the woodwork is still quite okay, I think. But the varnish is really ugly. I think maybe someone tried to re-varnish it at some point. It feels very rough. And you see here these markings. I think maybe somebody tried to re-varnish it, but I'm not sure. Um, Any way this needs to be redone. The only damage I see is here on top, where you have the veneer which is coming loose. Um, but it's still there, so I think we should be able to fix that. Um, cosmetically, it's very ugly. I mean, uh, in very bad condition. I think the design itself I already got quite a bit of nice comments about this design. It's a bit Art Deco-like. Um, I, I actually, I didn't like it at first, but it's growing on me. <laughs> um, but I mean, the woodwork is still in good condition. It's just the varnish, I think, that needs to be redone. But now the interesting part, let's have a look on the inside, because I'm, I'm sure you're quite curious about that. Okay. Let's turn this around. Oh, it's extremely heavy. Okay, I'm gonna bring it in a bit closer. Whew. There we have it. Um, and as you see, um, I think it is still complete. Maybe I will move it a bit farther away. Man, this thing is extremely heavy. Look at the woodwork. Okay, I think it is still complete. Um, obviously, it um, needs work, <laughs> but that's why it's here, right? So the power cord is totally gone. Well, the cloth covering is gone. The cord itself, we'll have to check, but I will replace it anyway. Um, we have a nice big Rola speaker. Um, then here we have the the logo of RR Radio, see? Um, so these guys, when they named their company, I think they got a bit of inspiration from Rolls-Royce. Well, clearly a bit of inspiration from Rolls-Royce. Um, inside it's really dirty, um, lots of dust, and unfortunately also quite rusty, which is not... Uh, not the best thing. Um, as you see as well, I don't have a back um, plate or a cover, black cover. And I can't find any picture online of an RR radio that has a back cover. So I don't even know how it would have looked like. Um, I think there is maybe one, but it's a totally different radio and it doesn't have any printings whatsoever on the back. Um, so I will have to make something and it will be something that I... Yeah design myself. I don't have anything to base myself on how this would have looked. Okay, so the nice thing is, however, that um, there is a website um, called VintageRadio.nl. It's the website from um, John Koster. Um, he is also a radio collector and he restored an uh, RR Radio 650. So not the 650L, but he restored a 650. And um, he actually drew the schematic for the 650. So, and since I believe that this one is 
extremely similar, apart maybe from the tone control. Um, the chassis looks to be identical. If you see the pictures from his website, um, I think the chassis looks almost identical. Um, now, since he drew the schematic for that one, we do have a starting point in terms of the schematic, which is nice. Um, and we can check how far this one deviates from that uh, schematic. Um, as a result, I also have the tube layout uh, on his website. So this is the is an 80, that's the rectifier. Um, that one is loose. I will have to check if that needs to be fixed or replaced. Um, this is the 2A5, that's the detector, I believe. No, no, that's the that's the output tube. Um, this is the is a 2B7, that's the detector, if I am correct. Um, then this is a 58, that's an IF tube. And then here in the back, you have a 2A7, and I guess that's the mixer oscillator. So we have a very standard five tube layout. Um, and also a transformer here in the back, so it's it's um, yeah it's not a hot chassis. Um, then some huge IF cans, capacitors as usual, and here our tuning condenser, which is also loose. Here on the back we have the voltage selector. It's currently set to 220. You, I don't think you can read it on the video, but you can set set it to 110, 130, or 220, and you do that by removing this plug and putting it in a different position. I also think that this is a fuse but I'm not sure. This switch, uh, don't know what it is, I also think it's a sort of tone control. Um, and then these um, outputs, I have no idea, I guess it's like a uh, pickup input. I know that the radio has a pickup input, I don't know which it is, which one it is. Um, and what these ones do, I don't know, maybe also, I have probably antenna uh, connections. Um, but I don't know which ones are which. We'll have to figure that out. Um, yeah. And now the next challenge is going to be getting this chassis out of the cabinet. Um, because I don't see at first sight how you can get it out. But I think anyway we'll have to start by trying to take off the knobs uh, on the front. Um, so let's do that first. Okay, so it seems like these are the ones that have a screw here on the side. This one as well. This one, I don't know. Yeah, this one also has a screw. So let me get my screwdriver. Okay, that was easy. Um, this one, that's also coming off. That's already good. Wow, this is the weight of this knob. This is like solid brass. Whew. <laughs> See, it's... Uh, <laughs> they didn't uh, cut costs on that part of the radio. Wow. Okay, this one is not coming off with this screwdriver. Oh, the weight of these knobs is incredible. Okay, so these are off. This one is also solid brass. Okay, let's put these to the side. Um, it would be cool if I would ever find one like this, but I think my chances are really low. Um, I do visit occasionally some um, radio fairs or uh, yeah, radio collector uh, expositions, maybe one day, but I'm afraid it won't happen. Oh, it just slides out. Is it just held in with the knobs? I think so. Okay, um, I'm gonna turn the radio around and uh, see if we can get it out. Okay, so I labeled the wires here so that I can cut them off. Uh, top one is red, bottom one is blue, and the one that I didn't label is here in the middle. Um, okay, let's see if we can get this out. Huh? What's this? Um, these are like plant beads, like like these things that you put in plants to 
soak up the, the water, the excess water. How did that get in here? Oh no, are we gonna get a rat's nest? Uh, I hope we don't, won't, but um, we'll never know. Allez, we, we'll see. Here we have the, the speaker wire is clipped here in the side with a metal clip. Let me just undo that first. It's like a brass version of a tie wrap. <laughs> nice. And the cable is quite long, so I can I think I can take it out without uh, because the paint here is still drying, so I can take it out and then cut it off afterwards. Oh man, this is heavy. Uh, oh, I have a feeling that uh, there's going to be a lot and lot of dirt inside. It's full of these plant uh, things. I'm just going to lift it with a transformer here. I think that's going to be better. Okay. Yeah, that's still quite okay. There's a lot of dust, but uh, I don't see any rodent poop, which is ha, always a good sign. I mean, nobody wants to work on rodent poop. I know we have a better view of the chassis. Uh, it's very dirty, very dusty, but doesn't look too bad. Those things here, I think, are leaked capacitors. Um, so, yeah, technically there will be some challenges, I think. Um, see, these are filter cans, I guess. Um, this uh, tuning condenser is incredibly big, but uh, it's all stuck, see? And these, the grommets are done, obviously. So it's all loose and everything. Um, yeah. Now let me first get the speaker wire here um, disconnected um, and then we can put the cabinet aside because that one is taking up so much space on the bench that uh, whew, um, I really want to get that one uh, out of the way uh, before continuing. Okay, so I've got the chassis out and yeah, it looks like a 90 year old chassis which has never been cleaned, which it is actually. Um, yeah, so see this is the dial plate, which is just a piece of cardboard and the band switch. <laughs> see, it just changes that piece of cardboard on the back. Quite funny. And let's have a look at the bottom part because I guess you're also curious for that. You just have to make sure that I don't, don't break any tubes. Well, it's very dirty. But most of it seems original. See, these caps, they are clearly yeah, dead. Because, see, that is a one which is has completely yeah leaked. This thing here, I think it's also a capacitor. That has also been leaking. Um, I don't see any damage to the transformer, however, that's fine. Um, for the rest, yeah, a lot of dirt and a lot of uh, lots of capacitors that needs changing. Yeah, um, so I think we know what to do. Uh, the first thing I am going to do here is take out the tubes to make sure that I don't damage them. And uh, then I'm just gonna take this outside <laughs> and um, blow it off with the air compressor, I think, because uh, there is just so much dirt on there everywhere that I think that's the best way to do it. Otherwise, it's all here on my workbench and in my workshop, and I want to avoid that. Um, and because this is such a rare radio, I'm going to document as much as possible. It um, could be that I don't end up putting everything in the video, but I'm ju going to document as much as possible because you never know what someone might need when they are also restoring a similar one. So this is the rectifier, the 80, and um, 
I'm taking it here with the mount because as I already said it's loose Okay, we'll have to see if that one needs fix. Yeah, see, there is a crack here in the base. Yeah, okay. It could be, it doesn't mean that the tube is bad. Could be that it's still okay. I'm just gonna put it aside. Wait, let me get a, a box here or something to put them in. Okay, so that they don't accidentally end up on the floor. This is the 2A5. Oh, that is really tight. Must be still original. See, this one is Sylvania. This is also Sylvania. That one was an Adzam tube. So it could be that the Sylvania ones maybe are original. I don't know. 2A5. This one. Yeah, the cap. Ooh. Ah, okay, the cap is coming off. Okay. Where can I find a marking here? I don't see any lettering on this tube whatsoever. But as I already said, this should be a 2B7. Can't find a marking. Okay, then this one. This uh, should be the 58. Yeah, 58 indeed. There is a mark on there. Good. And then the here in the back we should have the 2A7 come on they are still really tight so 2A7 yep 2A7 and they are all Sylvania, except the rectifier. So I think then these are all original still. Can you imagine? Wow. Okay, so these tubes are out. Um, I'm just gonna now take the chassis outside and give it a clean with the air compressor um, to get the worst dirt out of it before we can continue the work, because this is not not a nice uh, way to work on something if it's so dirty. Oh yeah, before I do that, I am going to remove this cardboard dial plate here because it's yeah, it's just cardboard and I don't want to damage it with the air compressor. So I'm just gonna remove it. I was hoping to find the indicator the pointer somewhere inside the radio but so far I haven't so I'm afraid that one is gone see yeah it's quite dirty but it's also yellowed I don't think I will be able to clean it up see here you can clearly see the difference between <laughs> the really badly yellow part and the only slightly yellow part um, how do I get this out there is just a hinge here, which comes probably from the indicator or the dial, the band switch. I would like to get that out too, but... Um, yeah, it's possible to get it out normally. Yeah, see. This is okay. It's also paper, or a sort of cardboard. Ah, no, it's plastic. This is a sort of plastic. Interesting. This one has a screw. See, there is a wave uh, indicator or a wavelength indicator, but um, see, somebody has marked here with a pen some places, obviously, where there are some stations. All 
right and it's also plastic and I'm gonna put this back and that previous screw I'm also gonna put it back just to make sure I don't lose them all right and now we are ready for the uh, air compressor okay so I am back from the air compressor and everything is looking a bit more <laughs> yeah, well a bit more presentable or it's not clean yet but it, at least I can work on it now um, well um, first thing I want to do is check the uh, power transformer because if that one is blown then I think we can forget about it um, I might be able to find such a transformer but let's first check this one it, uh, it will be already a relief if that one is good um, so it's quite easy to test the power transformer you can go ahead and try to measure resistances of windings and all these kind of things you will find open windings in such a way shorted windings are a bit more difficult to find because some windings they have really low resistance um, so what I do is I apply a very low voltage on the um, power transformer and see if well on the secondary windings you get what you expect um, yeah but first I had to figure out um, what are the connection points here for the windings yeah so I will put the schematic of the power section um, that I found on the website of John Koster I, I'll put it here on the on the screen so then you can follow along um, so we have um, a primary winding obviously uh, the primary the winding is here on the uh, right side of the uh, power transformer um, the switch the on off switch is located here inside the volume control but that one is really dirty um, the, I measure quite a high resistance between the contacts so I just bypass the switch or I, I put in the voltage just after the um, the switch the on off switch so we're gonna forget about the on off switch for a second um, so here you see this is the voltage selector I also took the voltage no I used the voltage selector actually see this is one side of the power cable it's going here through the voltage selector for 220 and then it's coming out over there so um, this is for 220 this is what is it 130 I believe and this is 110 and this is the uh, other side of the primary going to the on off switch so what I did is I put 2.2 um, .2 volts so a sine wave of 2.2 .2 volts RMS um, 50 Hertz um, into the primary here so 2.2 .2 volts that's exactly 1% of uh, 220 volts what it's um, designed for so we should measure voltages that are 1% of the original uh, voltage on the secondaries but let's first check the primary so this is one side of the primary and that's the other side of the 220 winding and as you can see indeed I have more or less to the two volts now it's a bit lower possibly because all these contact points here are dirty maybe there is also some resistance here in the in the selector switch or in the yeah voltage selector I don't know um, in, in any case it's 2.15 so 2.2 volts remember this is um, this represents 220 volts so if we multiply by 100 we should have the voltage that we are originally that we would put on the circuit um, when the radio is is operating on the mains um, so okay so this is the primary side then um, let's check the um, secondary sides and we will work from top to bottom so first we're gonna check the filament windings and I already figured out the wiring here um, so the filaments for the tubes for all tubes except the rectifier are here also on the right side the first and the last connection point and we measure here uh, 23 millivolts 23.7 millivolts so that means that this is this represents 2.4 volts um, AC uh, which is okay because I believe that these tubes they are all to like 2A7 2B7 so they should run on 2 volts heater windings so that's fine we have um, confirmation that the secondary for the 
heaters uh, should be okay. All right, so the next um, secondary, that's the main one. That's where the B plus will be created from. Um, so you have a winding with a center tap that is going to the, um, the um, rectifier tube. The rectifier tube is an, an, an AT uh, type tube. Uh, it's a, a full wave rectifier. And those taps are here on the left side of the transformer. It's the second, the third and the fourth tap with this here being the um, center tap which is connected to chassis. So if I measure between the first side of the winding and the center tap, I measure, come on, 3.48. So that's three and a half volts. So that represents 350 volts in real life. If I measure the other side, compared to the center tap again, it's 3.5, it's a bit higher because these uh, windings are never 100% symmetrical. So there we have also 350 volts. And if I measure between both sides of the winding, we get 700 volts. Well, seven volts in this case, but that represents 700 volts. So this winding is also okay. Then what is left is the third secondary and the third secondary is providing the heater winding, uh, the heater for the uh, rectifier. And it's also going to the field coil of the speaker. And that one is again here, the first and the last pin on this, on the left side here of the transformer. And there we measure 53 millivolts. Um, that represents 5.3 volts. And I think that's correct because the heater of uh, the a rectifier type 80 tube should be five volts. So I think that the transformer is still okay. Well. It is okay at low voltages. Um, what it will do on high voltages, we'll see that when uh, when we get it operating. But um, okay, that's fine already. That's good. Maybe second thing is also to check the transformer on the uh, the field coil of the speaker and see if that one is okay because that can also be uh, quite a pain to replace if we need to replace that one. So I'm just going to do the same thing with the cabinet. I'm also going to um, clean it with the air compressor and then I'm going to take out the speaker and we'll see if um, the field coil is fine. Uh, okay, now look at this. Um, I think I missed something. Look, there's another tube in there. Um, so that must be a difference then between the 650 and the 650L because um, on the schematic of the 650 that I shared earlier and on the tube layout that um, John Koster shared on his website there were only five tubes and this is a sixth tube so huh, um, let's see <laughs> what is underneath here I, I honestly, I have no idea, but, uh, okay, what have we got? Sylvania, it's another 58. Um, so then, does this thing have two IF stages? Could also be maybe that's used in the RF stage. I have no idea. I will have to check how it is wired up. But um, yeah, in the in the 650, there are clearly only five tubes, and this one has six. Okay, um, I think I might have an open field coil here. Um, uh, according to me, the two wires that I disconnected and which I marked with red and blue, those are the connections for the field coil. And if I measure those, see they are fully open. Yeah, the reading that you just saw was because I touched the probe, but uh, yeah, see there is nothing, absolutely nothing on there. And I think if I reverse engineered everything correctly, this should be the field coil. So I'm afraid I, we have an open field coil here. Hmm. And this um, should be the output transformer. And that one is measuring 
390 ohms so I think that's fine but this yeah that's not good news um, now let me take the speaker out and we can have a closer look at it shouldn't be that difficult I think it's just four screws here yeah see these it's just attached with four screws to the cabinet. I'm not gonna film that. I'm just gonna take it out and let's have a look at it on the bench. Okay, um, so I took the speaker out um, and it would be a pity if this one is unrepairable because look on the inside here. I mean, it looks like new. <laughs> it, if I would have told you this is a new old stock speaker on the inside, you would have believed me, I think. It's incredible how good it looks. The foam here is also, well, feels like new. Um, yeah, I guess they did make things from a better quality 90 years ago. But this is a... Uh, it... Yeah, it rubs slightly, but not a lot. Yeah, it's really, really great. Um, on the outside, yeah, we have the rusty things. Um, not gonna bother for that for the moment um, I'm just going to see if we can repair the field coil because I, I do believe that um, the field coil is, is um, open but I've tried measuring it again by stripping away here a bit of the metal and um, if I do that see then I get just a very high resistance it's not fully open so that makes me hope <laughs> that there is maybe just a bad contact inside or something. No idea. Um, let's see if I can take this cover plate off. Um, we have some nuts inside. So these are just screws that are held in place with a nut on the inside. So let's take those off. Okay, take them off really easily. That's really good. I just need to make sure that the nut is in place. Okay, that's my heart. Yeah, let me just do the other three and I will get back to you. Okay, I think I need to also loosen this one here on the inside. So I, uh, I am going to take off this screw. I have to do it anyway because yeah, this one was rubbing anyway to clean it inside. Um, even if I would have to get it working, then I still need to clean it inside in some way oh not sure if this will work yeah okay that was a bit scary okay that screw is out is that a washer or what is this ah okay so I think that nut it was yeah, not maybe glued a bit, but okay. Now it should come loose. Yeah, obviously it's also stuck on the bottom. Uh, I think this is glued in place. Let's see, not easy. Maybe I can drip some isopropyl in there and see if it loosens. I think it's slightly loosening. Just a bit more isopropyl on there. Yeah, it's coming off. Yeah, there we have it. Okay. Wait, let me just do it like this. I think I now should be able to take this part off here, right? Yeah. Okay, that one is coming out. Okay, so this is part is sticking through the 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 voice coil, and that's 
uh, what we just loosened on the inside of the speaker. I'm going to put that aside. And the advantage of this is that we can nicely clean everything now here inside. Yeah. Okay. Let me just study this a bit and then we will see if we can do something about the fact that it's uh, not making good contact. Okay, um, so I've got the voice coil uh, desoldered and now we can be like completely sure that it's open and let's check it again just uh, to be 100% sure that we're not going to disassemble this for nothing. See, it's open. Absolutely nothing. Oh, see, oh, oh, wait. See, that, that is, if I push the wires, then, okay, it's a huge um, resistance that I'm having, like 50 meg here, but... Uh, Yeah, might be that we that there is just a very very bad contact in there. Now the next thing here is how do we open this up because I think we need to remove the tape. There is some corrosion here on this wire. I don't know if you can see it. Let me bring it a bit closer. See there I see the wire of the coil which is attached here. It could be that this soldering point is simply corroded. Um, if you look at how much rust there is inside the radio, it wouldn't surprise me if that's the case. Um, okay. Here we have the both wires of the coil. Okay. So let's open this up a bit further here. See the wire here is wrapped around and then this is corroded. Oh, and here we have a break, but that might be me. It could be that I just broke it. I don't know. Um, 14 meg, 15 meg. Hmm. Um, yeah, okay, let me just clean up the wires here a bit. Maybe I'm digging a bit deeper. Um, see if I can find the problem here. Why are we getting such a high resistance between both contacts? I don't know. Or between both wires. There must be something else than just these oxidized contacts here. Okay, so update. Um, we have this right wire here. Um, that's the wire coming from the inside of the coil, I guess, because it's running like this. I, yeah, try to follow it along and it's running all like this, going across the corner here. And then, see, here it's broken. And let's see. Still 10 meg. So, see, 10 meg, that's not okay. I mean, it has to be. 1k or something in that area. I think this coil is toast. Okay, so I found a small piece of corrosion here and when I rubbed it off the wire underneath uh, immediately broke. See if I measure one side of the break, see this is this is the break. I don't think you can see it clearly on video but here is the break, here is one wire, there is the other one. 
if I measure from one side of the coil to this side of the broken wire, then I measure um, just a second. See, 25 ohms. So I guess that part is okay. Now, the other part. See, I measure here. Two, three megs. Whereas before we had in total, we had 10 megs. So that this means that this corrosion was indeed the cause of this extra resistance. Now, the problem is obviously if I fix this. The issue will not be gone yet because we still have a 3 mag resistance and I need to find probably another break in the wire <laughs> and how many breaks am I still gonna find um, so this is not going to be easy I not sure but I I think this uh, this coil is a loss Okay, so the last crucial um, component that we need to check um, is the output transformer. Because um, if that one is also bad, then I think I'm completely going to scrap the speaker um, and try to find another one. I'm just going to take off the output transformer and, and see if um, we can see something. Um, but first I need to desolder these wires. One side here is on the first pin from the right and the other side of the output transformer is here on the middle uh, tab um, connected so let me just desolder this and, and get the output transformer off the uh, speaker here but I can already see that the heat shrink or the, the shrink wrap around the, the shrink tubing around the wire is just deteriorating so we might have a short between the wires here somewhere okay so the output transformer is desoldered and now I think I have all the wires loose yeah now I should be able to take it off well since I've got the speaker <laughs> So uh, dismantled, I, I'm considering if I can manage to get it working that I'm just going to repaint it because it's almost completely dismantled now. <laughs> um, let, me put the, let me put this aside for a second. Let me hook up my signal generator here and see if we can um, measure if we have an output on the... Uh, if we have a working output transformer. Let's put this on the outer windings of the primary let's do one volt rms 50 hertz on the primary side of the of the transformer and let's see what we get here on this side 13 millivolt Twelve point eight, two volt 25 yeah see it's working 3 volt 38 okay so I think we have a working output transformer um, what we can also do is see when do we get um, let's say 100 millivolt here on the secondary okay so we have 10 millivolt now on the secondary and I'm putting in a 78 uh, wait 784 millivolts so that means that we have a turns ratio of 78 and a half um, more or less um, I don't know about this age of output transformers but that sounds okay that sounds okay I can go ahead do the calculations and everything but at least we see that we do have a functional output transformer um yeah so let me just turn this off here and then i'm gonna clean up this output transformer so that i think this is good news we only have the field call that we need to fix and i already have a couple of ids for that but um yeah that's gonna take a while maybe to get it fixed so um i've got a new output transformer here um no just kidding 
<laughs> I only cleaned and polished it and it turned out to be really nice. Um, I started cleaning um, it softly and then I noticed that at some places the shine of the nickel, I guess, nickel plating underneath was coming back, coming through. So I decided I decided to fully polish it with uh, a rotary tool and a, um, uh, a metal brush on the rotary tool. Um, and yeah, it turned out really nice. Uh, see, I didn't do the bottom. That one is still <laughs> like it was. But um, yeah, really happy with, uh, with how it looks. Now the problem with this is that maybe it'll set like a uh, reference for the rest of the radio. Um, if you look at the rest, uh, this is just sitting over there. Um, yeah, it's not great. Um, so if I go this route here, like the this transformer, yeah, then uh, I think I can, I'm gonna have a lot of work. Not sure yet, but I am happy with this result. I also uh, changed here the shrink wraps because those, yeah, the original ones here, see, they just completely deteriorated and they broke into pieces on by themselves. See, they just fall apart. Um, now, if somebody could tell me the specs of such an output transformer, that would also be interesting. Um, just to know a bit more about it, about the speaker. Um, it's labeled with 5005, I think. Um, yeah, so I think it's 78 um, turns ratio, like we already measured. Um, um, yeah, if somebody knows more about this, it's from a Rola speaker. You, we have seen the speaker. Uh, then it's always nice, I think, to check so that I, I can have a bit of a reference to know if this is still good but i think it is there is a bit of damage here this side was really rusted so you see that the plating is a bit damaged but okay it's not gonna get better here see there is also rust here on these edges um that brushed off but obviously then the plating underneath is damaged now i don't know yet what i'm gonna do with this if i leave it like this over time it will rust again i believe so i might apply some rust converter or some lacquer to this to the metal pieces here I don't know yet uh, for the moment I'm gonna put this aside and I'm not gonna put too much effort in this anymore because I first need to have the field coil repaired and if that is or a new field coil um, before I can yeah before it makes sense to restore the the speaker so otherwise I'm just wasting a lot of time here for nothing um, for the field coil, um, I I think I'm gonna have it rewound. Um, I found someone who wants to uh, or who can rewind uh, coils and transformers, so um, I think that's the way to go. Especially since my output transformer is fine, the speaker itself is fine, the uh, power transformer is fine. Um, that makes means that basically from the critical components it's only the field coil that is bad and that's the most simple one of all the um, all four so i think it makes sense to have it uh, rewound tell me what you think but i i think i'm gonna go for that route so um yeah i think that's enough for this video right just for the start of the project um i have a bit of homework to do um, I need to find a way to fix the field coil and then more importantly or let's say as equally important I need to think about where I'm going with this if I really want to do a full-blown restoration because that would mean taking everything off repainting everything um, it's gonna be a lot of work um, but maybe it's worth it we'll see um, so I'll think about that and uh, if you want to see the rest of the project and if you want to see if I get it working, um, subscribe to the channel and uh, don't forget to like the video and post a comment. I always love to see some reactions. Um, so thanks a lot for watching and I hope I'll see you in the next video. Take care. Bye bye.